Hi, everybody. How are you doing this morning? Thanks for coming. Hi, everybody online. So my name is John Dadelen. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, at the, uh, um, which is just up the hill from UC Berkeley. Uh, we're a Department of Energy Research Lab. Um, so that means we work on trying to invent new things to make energy cheaper and cleaner. And today I want to talk about Matt Scholar. Um, it's a project we've been working on for a few years now. And this is sort of a bait and switch. We are a search engine, but that's not our main research. And I actually want to pitch you all on how language technologies can completely revolutionize science and energy. And I think that there's a lot of contributions that this community can, can bring back to science that we're missing right now. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of how that can work, and then also how we're trying to put that into the hands of researchers. So first, I want to pitch you on why materials are important. So all of the technology that you use today and all of the technology you'll use in the future, it's not just the inventiveness of engineers that, that brings it forth. Actually, engineers are so creative, they're so intelligent, they can design anything. They'll make you an elevator to the moon, except that the materials that they have to work with cannot withstand the forces or hold enough energy or do all the things they want them to do. So they're, they're bottlenecked by the materials that they have to work with, the, the alloys, the compounds. Um, so some examples of technologies that were purely enabled by materials advances. They, we knew in theory it could be done, but we didn't know what materials would enable it. You have high temperature super alloys in the engines of planes that allow them to be much more efficient. You have hybrid solar cells. So these are, are things like perovskites uh, that allow solar cells to be flexible, much cheaper, can be uh, manufactured as thin films and put on top of other solar panels and make them 50% more efficient. Um, Lithium-ion batteries, which are enabling electric vehicles and, and green transportation, and things like catalysts for chemical reactions. Um, the only issue is that uh, we're, as re materials researchers, we don't have access to all the information that we need to use, or that we need in order to make these advances. So uh, most of the knowledge about the human knowledge on material science is trapped, basically, in unstructured forms, the text tables and figures of uh, millions of research papers. And I'm sure many of you maybe have been there. <laughs> we can't read everything, and so we miss stuff. And we also can't leverage this larger picture this, uh, that the literature provides on, on, on things. So we do our best. But the goal that we have as a project is to try to use natural language processing algorithms to harness all of this information and do material science. So. Let's talk about uh, some of the things that we wish we could do as materials researchers that are not possible right now. Um, so some of these are small things, like if I do a search for uh, titanium uh, nickel tin on Google Scholar or something like that, the slightly different ordering of those elements is still the same chemical formula, but it's not going to link to the same um, material. Uh, and also, there are different ways that, che that chemists and material scientists write things that are basically the same, but uh, conventional ways of doing search or doing language knowledge discovery wouldn't surface them. Some medium difficulty things or medium importance things. Um, it's really hard to ask certain questions, uh, such as like, what are all the materials that have been tried to store lithium uh, in, in, such, in like a battery or something like that? Um, or just like facts. So sometimes just looking at facts is actually pretty hard for us. Um, and big things. We can't use this big body of information to make predictions about what we should study next or maybe how to synthesize something. Those are really actually big challenges to our field. You want to take it here? You, you can grab it. Okay. My slides will be up online too afterwards, so you can, you can have them. Um, so that's where this, this project comes in, Matt Scholar. It's, uh, I think, th about three, four years old now um, it, since we began. Uh, and it's, it's twofold, right? We, we have, first, we want to use supervised natural language processing to just extract this data out and make data sets that we can use to, to do machine learning analysis or answer some of these bigger questions that we have. And then also, we want to use self-supervised or unsupervised natural language processing to kind of uh, uncover the emergent properties of large bodies of scientific knowledge. There are, uh, there's a lot of untapped potential within the literature that, that uh, we're trying to leverage. So I'm going to kind of give you some pictures of both of those today, and then how we're trying to start making these things into tools that researchers can use in their day-to-day -day work. OK, first, let's talk about name density recognition. This might be a task that many of you are familiar with. Um, materials researchers are, are usually not familiar with this. 
um, because it's, it's still new to us. Um, we want to extract knowledge and facts out of research papers and then make databases of this knowledge that is searchable. Um, so in this case, um, we started with something like a lot, these recurrent neural network LSTM type approaches, and they did pretty well. Um, we were getting F1 scores around 0 0.86, 0 0.85, something around there. Um, and to do this, you annotate by hand thousands of abstracts, as a, as a usually PhD student like me is doing this. Um, and then we train these models, and then we can run them on our whole data set. Um, so this allows us to, to start building these like search indices. Um, this is kind of what that pipeline looks like. So you would take a big database of, of text that you get from the internet. We have about 5 million full, full research papers in our corpus that we've collected uh, in collaboration with some other groups. Um, you tokenize them. So this is another uh, place where conventional language technology approaches fall short, and we had to do our own, our own uh, developments. Because when you tokenize chemical formulas and other ways of writing things in science, uh, it's not quite um, straightforward sometimes. Then you label them, you turn them into a training set, you train your model, you, you maybe get some word embeddings for them or some, some models like BERT that you can then use to, to create dense representations of these concepts and words. Then you can use those to, to do useful things like extracting data or uh, some other downstream tasks. Now, the, the big development that's been happening, I think it's affecting a lot of us, um, is these big large language models that use billions of parameters and have state-of-the-art performance on many downstream tasks, uh, things like question answering, information extraction, things like that. Um, so in our case, we find that these models do improve our scores, not by as much as you might think. Um, but we also found an interesting feature that uh, if you pre-train these on scientific text in general, they do almost as well as pre-training them on just a similar size corpus of just material science. We, do, we, we slightly edge them out on the tasks of named entity recognition and a couple other things. But the good news, basically, is that it seems like for scientific purposes, a general model trained on general scientific text can be used almost as effectively as these ones that you trained yourself. So for a lot of researchers in, in various fields, this pre-training a BERT model might be a little bit outside their ability uh, because they may not have the, the just hardware to do it. Um, or the experience to do it. So luckily, they can just download a pre-trained model and then use it um, for, for their, their, their own tasks and maybe only fine-tune it on the, the, the downstream task rather than pre-training their own model. So we've used these, these kind of techniques. Um, we've extracted properties from millions of, of abstracts. So we started with the abstracts because they usually contain a concise description of what was done, what the big um, conclusions were, and what materials were, were studied. Uh, this is a good proving ground for testing out ideas. Um, and we've, we've extracted millions of, research, uh, of, of properties from research papers. And this represents a really significant um, like step, step change in the amount of data available to researchers. So previously, there were only maybe 100,000 to maybe 1 million compounds and their properties in, in material science databases. And these were usually made with... Uh, first principle simulations, so they weren't even from the experimental literature. And the data set sizes that we tend to work with from experimental literature are in the hundreds of data points. So this is, this is a really important transition period where we start getting things at scale. Um, and science has not traditionally scaled well, and we're trying to, to learn from all of you about how we can try to do that. Um, and so we're, we're using Vespa as our, as our search backend. So we want to make, start turning this data set into a tool that people can use to surface ideas and understand the, the literature at scale. Um, and Vespa has been a really nice way to, a nice tool for that purpose. Um, we've got users all over the world. Uh, and we actually have not launched the site. We just uh, built it and then gave it to one or two of our, our collaborators to test out. And it sort of is just like by word of mouth started being used by hundreds of people all over the world. And we, we actually don't know who they are. Um, so it's just you know like a couple degrees separation from us. Um, mostly the United States, Germany, and uh, China. Um, OK, so uh, let's, let's just, sh I just want to show a quick example of something you might want to do. Um, so uh, a search that might have been difficult with uh, traditional ways of doing it on um, maybe like Semantic Scholar, Google Scholar, something like that. Uh, is find papers that are about gold nanoparticles, but not nanorods. So, that, so nanorods have an aspect ratio to them. And then narrow down to features that, uh, to papers that are only about gold nanoparticles as catalysts. 
doing that search might be kind of difficult. And also, you, you would want to see the bigger research picture there. So um, let me just start the, the GIF. Uh, so we, we have our first text with a couple, you know, must include nanorods, must not include nano, or must include nanoparticles, not include nanorods. We can filter it down by material that's mentioned in those research papers. And we can end up getting to our paper. So I'll, I'll just show it one more time because I went kind of fast. So we're going to select the material, scroll down to the applications, select catalyst. So now all the research results are catalysts with gold nanorods, or gold nanoparticles, no nanorods. And you can actually go to the research papers. So that's just one way of, of doing um, information discovery. And one thing that we, we've noticed when, when we use our, our, uh, our way of indexing these research papers rather than the kind of more conventional search way of doing it, like, so this is like chemistry-aware indexing, things like that, um, you can avoid problems that might have hit you before. So, for example, in this paper, um, th they never use the, the actual AU element name for gold or a chemical formula. They just say the name. So this, this happens all the time in chemistry research. We have a word for something, and then we have a chemical representation and chemical formula. And those two things are, are the same concept, the same, uh, the same thing. But if you index one, you might not get papers on the other if you do a search for that. And so this is an example. This is, the, I think, the second or third result. Um, this is a paper. If you do the same search on Google Scholar, you're going to be actually served with millions of research papers about gold nanoparticles used in drugs because the biology research is so much bigger than the material science research. And that's not useful to us. And even if you append material science to it, doesn't, this paper wouldn't surface to you. Um, so it, it's, it's sometimes hard to find things we're looking for. Um, something else we can do is we can train these language models on the, the, this corpus of data that we have. And what we find is actually they, the, the embeddings or the, de the dense representations for words um, encodes information in a way that is consistent with how we think about materials. So for example, the word embedding for lithium cobalt oxide that our model learns from just reading research abstracts uh, is really, really similar. In the, it's, the, it's very nearby in this vector space to a bunch of other materials that are used for the same application, which is the, the, the cathode, the electrode in a lithium ion battery. And then if you also train that, if you also look at something like a, a property of materials, like ferromagnetic, all of the, the embeddings in this vector space that are closest to that word are ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic. So this, to, to, to people that work with these technologies, this um, makes sense, but this blew the minds of all the materials researchers I've shown it to, because uh, they didn't realize that you could learn representations for these things that then, this is extremely useful. Because now what we can do is turn it into a big, basically a big graph of a big knowledge map and then start, start at one node and work your way out around it and try to understand what are the relationships between these things. So this is a T-SNE uh, visualization of that. So our, our vectors are 200 dimensional. Um, and when you visualize them in two dimensions, you can see this is, the, I think, the 10,000 most common uh, materials in our, in our corpus. And they cluster based on their, their application, their properties. So this uh, blue cluster in the middle here are the thermoelectrics. They turn heat into electricity. They're used on the, the Voyager spacecraft, for example, that is uh, starting to send back some weird data. I think you might have seen it in the news. Um, that's what's powering it. There's a nuclear material that's producing heat, and then that turns into electricity. Um, and uh, this, is, this is really interesting, because you can start mapping the space of all human knowledge about materials and try to understand what are the, the origins of, this, this, uh, of the, how, how properties are manifested in things. So the, the, this is something that we've been trying to do for many, many hundreds of years. So for example, Mendeleev really changed chemistry by noticing that elements, uh, and, and this was before we really had a strong knowledge about quantum mechanics or <laughs> even like, you know, the structure of, yeah, the structure of, uh, of matter. And what he did is he, he laid out the elements based on like kind of how they react with each other. The metals tend to add, like react with acid and produce gas and stuff like that. And the notable thing he did, though, lots of people had tried something like that before, but he left holes in it based on where he thinks new elements should be. And indeed, that's where elements were discovered to be. So when we train on this and we map out the word embeddings for the, element, uh, the elements themselves, what we find is it it's, has an extremely similar structure to the periodic table. And it has never seen the periodic table. It doesn't know anything. I, that like the the input to this model are one hot en encodings of just the words existences, right? Um, and so th you, you can see that this plot, if you actually trace down the the columns of the periodic table here, those are those lines I'm showing in the gray there. They actually the same columns are 
represented in this, t even a Tisni, which is sort of warped view of the, of the thing. So the nearest neighbors of elements are the nearest neighbors on the, the periodic table, which is, the reason that is, is because elements behave similarly. They manifest in the literature um, and in chemical formulas based on their properties. And the periodic table is laid out based on their properties. So you can rediscover kind of concepts that scientists use in these word embeddings. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so what I did, I just vis I'm just uh, using them as to help you see uh, what's going on here. So if you trace down this column, that's that arrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, cadmium and lead are, are probably uh, mentioned, so, so one, one, this is a T-SNE plot, which kind of warps the vector space. They might actually be closer together in the higher dimensional dimensionality space than they, this might suggest. Um, but also, cadmium and lead are both toxic, so a lot of times in literature they're, they're mentioned together and like we should not use them in, in materials. So that might be one reason why they're closer than, than this case. But there is uh, some sort of like similar structure to the, the overall data. Yeah, yeah, mercury is also poisonous too, yeah. Okay, and so uh, how, so we wanted to see like how good are these representations and actually encoding the, the chemical knowledge in there. So we trained just a, a simple linear model on uh, the like a couple properties of these things. So this is the embedding of the word the word uh, the, the element name, uh, and then we're mapping it onto properties that are of the elements, and we find really really strong correlations there. And the areas where it, where it kind of fails are things like TC or RA, and these are also used as ab abbreviations for like critical temperature. So that's the reason that they're kind of off the distribution, that's where some of the noise comes in. And so now what we're trying to do is use contextualized language models like, like uh, BERT, things like that, which can remove that, that noise from, from uh, or the, the degeneracy in that. And F, for example, Fahrenheit, that kind of thing. Um, so now we can map the space of materials, we can start asking questions, what what is the similarity between a material and an application? And we can get a heat map of what materials uh, are similar to that application. Um, and basically, where do they lie? So this is the heat map for thermoelectric. And you can see a lot of the best known thermoelectrics here are very strongly correlated with that, that term. Um, and same with luminescent. And, and for us, the ability to ask, why is something more similar to both thermoelectric and luminescent and less similar to some other property? Like, what chemically is going on there? Um, and now we can actually start interrogating these questions a little bit deeper. Um, so one thing we wanted to do is, is try to put this in the hands of, of people. So we actually built a search interface that uses the word embedding visualization. Um, you can do things like get the, the uh, isolate things by similarity, and then retrain a TSNE to revisualize just those points and their relationships to each other, and start segmenting the, the data. And then you can actually click on these individual ones or, or highlight a, a group of them and then rerun it and then actually eventually get yourself to a search. So in this case, um, we, we went to the materials cluster, the, the top uh, results for similar to thermoelectric, um, and then grab bismuth tel telluride uh, search results. You can also do things like get insights from the compositions of these um, materials. So if you, if you look at the top materials that are most similar to the word organic, you can find that the elements in those materials are distributed how you might expect. And then you can see the same thing with batteries. So oxides are really pre prevalent in battery materials. And piezoelectrics, you, you, you see a slightly different distribution, but it's... it's uh, um, so so these are, we're starting to be able to actually get what are the correlations between the composition and properties, which is the ultimate question in material science. If you could predict all of something's properties from just the combination of the elements, then what you can do is just start mixing and matching elements, predicting their properties, and find yourself into an area where there might be new materials that, that can help, help society. Um, so the, the larger impact that these embeddings have had, um, they're actually used as representations for elements in, in, in the state of the art, the, all of the best um, models for predicting materials properties from composition. So those two are Roost and CrabNet. Um, and we actually are, are using these models ourselves, or using these embeddings ourselves, and we're trying to take it to the next level. So, so we haven't published that research yet, and I can't get into it today. Um, but we're finding that when you pre-train models on big data sets of text, you basically can use some of that background knowledge about stuff 
about materials, about matter, about chemistry, and bring that knowledge and distill it into your, your model that you're going to then fine-tune on some sort of uh, predictive task that might be more scientifically rigorous or, or specific, um, I, I guess I mean. Um, so that's all and good. Like We can try to understand what's already been done. But can you actually use this to make anything new? And usually, this is where the second half of my talk would begin. But I don't have time uh, in, in this short one. So if you'd like to t check that out, we had a, a pretty uh, interesting paper that we published a couple years ago. Um, people like Vinod Kostela and Andrew Yang were tweeting it out. And uh, it, it was pretty, uh, pretty fun. Um, but here's a QR code that'll take you to the, the paper. And uh, you can find it. There's some news articles about it uh, that, that for maybe not a non-material science audience. Um, but basically, we showed that you could discover new materials using these, these methods that scientists had missed. Um, so these are materials that we know exist, but we didn't know that ha they had these important properties. Um, and so this is kind of the direction our research is going now, is using these, these self-supervised models, combining that with other data that we might know from maybe simulations and things like that, and then predicting new materials. So um, this is a big effort with a lot of people who have been involved. Here's, here's just some of them. Uh, and we also have some, uh, so our work is supported, supported by the Toyota Research Institute, uh, the, Advanced Materials Discovery and Design Group. And then these are some other folks that um, have helped in meaningful ways. Olga um, wrote the material parser. So these, this really complicated, essentially, regex nightmare of uh, parsing chemical formulas. She solved that. Um, and then we also our work is hosted on the Supercomputing Center at, at LBNL, uh, NERSC. Um, and uh, SPIN, specifically, is what hosts our website. Um, so thank you very much for having me at this conference. I really enjoyed meeting all of you. And thank, uh, I'll take a couple questions. Yeah. Sure. Uh, we don't have much time, unfortunately. Yeah, like time so only one. one. I'll be around afterwards too, and you can always email me too. This is really exciting stuff. This is great stuff. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned earlier that science doesn't scale, and uh, I also wonder about search engine scaling. So uh, you mentioned some of the like uh, um, somatic scholar and things like this. They have a different approach. They do a lot more with citation analysis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are other. So how can you take your work and make it into a modular part of a larger ecosystem of search engines? Could you mm -hmm. plug in your chemical parser into uh, some other system? You know, have you been thinking about that kind of thing? Have you talked yeah. to Semantic Scholar people, you know, all that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, I've talked to Semantic Scholar a bit. Um, actually, so when the pandemic happened, we transitioned to trying to do a lot of this for the COVID-19 literature. Um, so, so actually we were involved in, we just, we had some meetings with them about how we could help and, and work together. Um, I think that things like the, the, the language models that we're training and the tokenizers we're using and the, the chemical parsing, a lot of that, uh, we're trying to, to write it as, as modular pieces that you could then plug in. So like, for example, our tokenizer is something that's just like you can use and we have it on a GitHub repo. Um, so that's something that I think is a, a really good direction to go. Uh, what we've found is, um, especially like this is kind of what in our, in our work on COVID-19, we realized that domain expertise is really, really important for making this stuff. Like if you're just a, an expert in language technology trying to solve some of these issues with those, those tools, unless you're working extremely closely with the scientists who know that field really well, you might run into um, potholes you didn't know existed, basically. Um, so, so that's what we're trying to do is build things that can then be adopted more broadly um, by people. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you much. again, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>